Dr. Jane Goodall is a groundbreaking scientist turned global activist who has spent six decades inspiring hope and turning it into action on behalf of the natural world. We're here in Alaska. Hey, it's us, the Krat Brothers. Zoologists by training, the Krat Brothers have dedicated over 25 years to educating children about animals through numerous award-winning TV shows that have aired all over the world. Hi, Dr. Jane. Um, it's so great to meet you. I'm Martin in the blue. And I'm Chris in the green. Um, we are honored to be here with you today to talk about animals, conservation, and uh, your career, and um, any anything animal related. Yeah, and you've been a great inspiration to us, so I'm sure that'll come out. <laughs> well, it's lovely to meet you. And, you know, we must remember we're animals too. <laughs> we mustn't yeah. forget that. Yeah, we like to use the term fellow creatures, you know, yeah. our fellow creatures. And yeah. one of the things that we always saw you as a as a trailblazer on is because when you started out early in your career, the science community looked at animals in terms like, like they numbered them when they studied them, right? And they looked at them in terms of of objects and things. And you you changed that whole dynamic. You began to to name the chimpanzees that you were studying. You looked at them in terms of their personalities and emotions and things like that. And that, that is really, to us and what we do, that's, that was a trailblazing thing. And uh, first of all, we appreciate you doing that. And we were wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, why you got to that point doing that and what kind of pushback? Because I think you had quite a bit of pushback from the scientific community. Well, how did it start? I started, I was born loving animals, just born that way. I mean, people say what triggered it? No, I don't know, maybe something when I was in my mother's womb, I have no idea, she doesn't know either. So, you know, right from the beginning, my dream was to go to Africa and live with wild animals and write books about them. And that was because I read Dr. Doolittle. I don't know if you've read Dr. Doolittle, but uh, he takes animals from the circus back to Africa, in one of the stories, and he learns to speak animal language. And um, secondly, I wanted to write books because I always loved writing as well as nature. And I had an amazingly supportive mother. And I think that was the key because everybody else laughed at me. I was 10. I was going to go to Africa. How would I get to Africa? First of all, there was a war raging, World War II. Secondly, Africa was far away and we didn't have any money. We didn't have any money. And thirdly, I was just a girl. Dream about something you can achieve, I was told. But my mother said, if you really want this, then you're going to have to work awfully hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, maybe you find a way. That's amazing. So I think the fascinating thing coming back to your question is when I finally saved up money and got to Africa when I was invited by a school friend, I heard about Dr. Lewis Leakey. Somebody said, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis. And that led to him offering me this opportunity to go and study not just any animal, but chimpanzees, most like us, because, because I hadn't been to college. He wanted somebody whose mind was uncluttered by the reductionist thinking of the scientists at that time. Wow. And he also wanted a woman because he felt a woman might be more patient in the field. And, you know, this was just, I was there at the right time in the right place. And it was a mixture of luck and determination. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, we we grew up in a very wild, exotic place, the wilds of suburban New Jersey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there weren't really, I mean, we could go out in the backyard with box turtles, <laughs> and garter snakes and things. So those are real wild animals, real adventures. So that got us connected to nature. But also it was your film, um, about chimpanzees, National Geographic, and other films like about African wild dogs that really showed us all the other creatures in the world. So, you know, the introduction you made to us as little kids to chimpanzees and other animals around the world, that really inspired us um, to really start thinking about all the creatures we share with whom we share this planet, you know, and uh, that kind of set us off on our lifelong creature adventure. 
But isn't it fascinating how people begin? Isn't it fascinating the connections that people make? You learn about that in the rainforest. Everything's inter interconnected. Every little species has a role to play in this great tapestry of life. And I see us in the same kind of picture. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, and it was you inspiring us as kids um, that caused us eventually to make wildlife series for kids so we could expose other children, you know, to all the amazing animals. And that's, you know, that's why we produce Kratz creatures and have continued with other series and are now doing wild Kratz. Isn't it magical? Yeah. You're, you're now, you say you were inspired by me and obviously bring the geographic in there because they had a major role to play. And my, my first husband, Hugo van Nauwijk, who took the documentaries. And because of all of that, um, you got inspired to do what you're doing. So you're handing that on to hundreds and thousands of children. Right. And hopefully, who knows what they will do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we've, we've um, in our work, we've kind of looked at animals as creaturenalities. You know, they have like natural inclinations, but also individual personalities or creaturenalities. And actually in our new show, one of the running gags is every episode, we name an animal. You know, we meet new animals and we give them a name. So that's a big part of Wild Kratz. <laughs> I'm gonna name him Little Howler, Spooky, Slider, Bandito, Wilbur, Fingertip, yep. Fingertip it is. But we see we see those personalities in animals, you know, on on every expedition we do, uh, regardless of the species, from meerkats to lions and African wild dogs. I mean, years ago when we were spending weeks on end with a specific pack of wild dogs, it was amazing because following them around 24-7, we really started getting to know each dog in the pack as personalities. There were the dogs who were particularly skilled at hunting. There was one who was very curious. There was even a favorite aunt of the pups who loved to interact with them. It's so special when you can get to know animals on that level of seeing them as individuals. And we see those personalities or creaturenalities in all kinds of animals, time and time again. It's yeah. so like us. And you know, I, can you believe, do, do you really think anybody thinks that animals don't have personalities? You know, I mean, I, I get so irritated when people say to me, oh, we admire you so much for giving personalities to the chimpanzees. And I say, I didn't give them personalities. <laughs> they have their personalities, <laughs> right? Right, you just have to see them. They're you're there. illuminating yeah. them, yeah. <laughs> so um, we were wondering, like, we think your Roots and Shoots organization is amazing. And I uh, was just wondering what your current projects are. Well, our current projects, you know, you know how Roots and Shoots began with 12 high school students in Tanzania in 1991. And so these young people were 19, 20, even 21, and still in high school. And some of them were concerned about the environment. Why wasn't the government prosecuting illegal dynamiting or poaching in the national parks? Some were worried about the street children with no homes. Some were concerned about the mistreatment of animals in, in, um, in the markets or stray dogs. And that's how it all began. We had a meeting, they brought in their friends and Roots and Toots began with the goal of Every group will choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment, because we're all interrelated. Mm -hmm. So that's how it began. But I think the key thing about Roots and Shoots, which is why it's spread around the 68 countries now, is because it's youth driven. So the young people who now, we now have members, kindergarten, university, everything in between, and actually more and more adult groups. But basically, they get to choose the projects. It's not a top down, it's a bottom up, it's grassroots. Oh, so we've had it spreading into remote areas where we're lucky to even find out it exists because a child goes from this school where there's a Roots and Shoots group to another school miles away where there isn't, but starts it up because he's passionate. Right. You know, everybody's different and we care about animals and the environment. But you have to you have to realize that 
that's all tied up with reduction of poverty because when you're really poor, you do what you do to keep yourself and your family alive. And that may involve killing animals to sell them as bushmeat. Right. So we have to alleviate poverty. But once we do, and once the children understand, they they care as much as we do. So education is so key, and that's what you are doing with your program. You know, and, and that's true. Like what we set out to do, inspired by people like you, was to, we realized at the time when we were in college studying zoology that there were no animal shows for kids in the U.S., just made for kids. And so we wanted to do something to help endangered species by just introducing kids to all the amazing animals with whom we share our planet. And then we were really surprised by our second series with Subumafu. I mean, we always hoped this would happen, but it happened so quickly that we started getting letters from the fans of our shows saying, we love these animals. What can we do to help them? Yeah. So that's what inspired us to scramble and put together Crab Brothers Creature Hero Foundation and come up with a project. And like you described, we asked on the internet, what animals would you like to save? And, the, you know, they they kind of put in their... Um, in their, in their requests. And it came out that our first project was to be focused on grizzly bears. Yes. And so that's, that's how we came to create Grizzly Gulch. And the way we did that was we did a tour of live shows at different zoos and the kids who came to see us, their being there caused donations to come in and to create the fund that purchased the land. And really the principal function of this wildlife refuge is like 1600 acres. It's prime maternal grizzly bear habitat for when they come out of hibernation to feed their cubs in the early spring. And since it's been protected, there's new wolf packs, they're, you know, gri the grizzly bear um, population, they're really using the land. So it was all done with kid power, you know? And what's wonderful, too, to see is not only the conservation impact, but also the impact on kids because they love, you know, they have this interest, animals, nature. And when when you give them a way to, to sort of act upon that interest and to, to, to help the animals that they love, they get so enthusiastic. And it is so inspiring to watch all the projects they do to help because – Currently, we're doing another um, wildlife refuge project with Wildcrats fans, young and old alike. And kids are coming up with all kinds of ways to raise money for the for the fund. And they're realizing that they can have an impact, yeah. that they're not too young or too small to have an impact. Yep, that's, and that's exactly, I mean, Roots and Shoots and your program is the same. And yeah. You know, the main message of Roots and Shoots is every individual matters and has a role to play. And every one of us makes an impact on the planet every single day. We've, we've seen young people grow because they're told that they matter. I guess we were also going to talk about monarch butterflies. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, you yeah. You are working on monarch butterflies. We are working on monarch butterflies. And so how great we've got together on monarch butterflies, that amazing <laughs> migration. I mean, yeah. there's amazing animal migrations, but then migration that depends on a caterpillar hatching in, in um, Mexico, flying to a certain distance before it gets to, where do they get to? Up to Canada, Finally. as far up as up into Canada. Where we are uh, right now. <laughs> yeah. So half, halfway there, yeah. They uh, they lay their eggs on milkweed. And then the next generation of caterpillars, I mean, they've got nobody teaching them, but they know to fly on to Canada. And then I think they fly all the way back in one, but what an amazing migration. You know, it is so amazing. And, you know, I, I remember learning about that migration, you know, early on in school or whatever. But the piece that I was never taught was the piece that you just talked about, which is now to me, one of the most fascinating is that that migration happens over multiple generations. It is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're just little tiny insects that weigh as much as a tissue, like a Kleenex. And um, and they're able to travel the, that that distance, and 
get through all those obstacles. And so, yeah, it's a great thing that we can, through our organizations, uh, do something to help these awesome creatures. Yeah, and getting together means we get even more of an army of young people helping the monarch butterflies. <laughs> That's so kind of exciting. Yeah. All the way along the route. That's amazing. Yeah. We did an episode on um, monarch butterflies for our current series called Voyage of the Butterflyer. And we had a little butterfly machine and we miniaturized and we joined them in oh, yeah. the- In uh, animation. In it's animation. animation. <laughs> <laughs> One day we'll be able to do it in real life. We joined them um, on the migration, uh, through, you know, this, this wildcat story. The new generation of monarchs is here, safe and sound and heading north. Look at them go! Yay! A lot of our uh, monarch butterfly, a lot of our Roots and Toots monarch butterfly groups, they have, they make wings, they attach the wings, and they, they have a headband with antenna. So they 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 perform as monarch butterflies, <laughs> little <laughs> plays, and, and kids love acting. That's part of roots and shoots: acting, singing, dancing, having fun. Wow. Don't you think if children don't have fun, the whole thing's going to go dead? Right, fun is the key. Well, for all those reasons, it'll be fun to do this project together. Move for monarchs. We're really yeah. excited. A partnership between Roots and Shoots and Crap Brothers Creature Hero Foundation. Yep, and you know, if children really understand in a simple way the magic of migration, how much we don't know about it yet, the magic migration of the of the turtles in the ocean, mm -hmm. the magic migration of some of the birds, I mean who travel thousands and thousands of miles. The Swifts who spend three years in the air with never touching land after leaving the nest. They eat in the air, they sleep in the air, they mate in the air, they groom in the air. And then after the three years they're mature, they go back to the very place they were born. I mean, what is it? Nobody really understands. Yeah, that is incredible. So much to learn. Yeah. And that's why for all the kids who love animals, if you're interested in, you know, answering these questions, you know, there's so many questions in the natural world left to answer and to learn about. That's right. And you know, I always say, I always say to, to young people, you know, if you want to, to study animal behavior, there's never ever been a more exciting time in my life than now because when when I was growing up, science was saying animals don't have intelligence. We're the only creatures with minds capable of solving problems. Now it's opened up and the study of animal intellect is blossoming. And we now know, did you know, by the way, bumblebees can be taught how to roll a little bead and drop it down a hole and then they get a nectar reward. And other bumblebees who have not been taught can do it straight away, having watched the trained bumblebees. Wow, I did not bit. know that. That it's sounds a like a good show for us. The size of a pinhead. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> we'll have to make an episode about that for sure. <laughs> yeah. And we're, we're actually just doing an episode on the intelligence of ravens and how oh. smart they are and how they even understand the scientific concept of water displacement, right? So they're doing physics. Yeah, it's pretty that's incredible. Right. I'm waiting for the day when you tell somebody about an amazing animal performance and they don't say, wow, that's amazing. I want them to say, well, of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> well, we've got uh, we've got a lot of kids that watch the show that um, that I think are inspired to pursue careers in science or animal behavior or conservation. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of times, a lot of questions that we get, it, was there like a life changing experience that you had with an animal that caused you to to pursue conservation or your career or just impacted your life immensely? I know people always ask me that. And I'm the wrong person to ask because I started that way. I mean, I, you know, obviously the chimpanzees, so like us, really enlarged my understanding and helped me to confront the scientists who said how different we were. 
But I don't think those wonderful moments actually influenced the direction that I was taking. I mean, one wonderful moment was when I was following David Graeby at the first chimpanzee to lose his fear of me, whose image I always have up behind me. And um, I, I thought I'd lost him. And when I pushed through this tangle of vegetation, there he was looking back. I mean, it looked as if he was waiting for me. Maybe he was, I don't know. So I sat down near him and there was a ripe red palm nut on the ground and I picked it up and held it out to him on the palm of my hand and he turned his head away. And then I put my hand closer and he looked directly in my eyes, took the nut, dropped it. But then he gave me this gentle, reassuring squeeze, which is how chimps reassure each other. And so we communicated in a way that must predate human language. Wow. So if any moment really, I think looking in hindsight, really, really focused me on, I must protect these chimpanzees. That would be that moment. That's amazing. That is amazing. I, I know for me, like you, my interest in animals was always there since, since I was a child. But one thing that really gave me a lot of urgency to do something to help endangered species was when I went to Costa Rica um, filming uh, shortly after getting out of college. And previously I had been really interested in amphibians because I went to college in North Carolina where there's the greatest diversity of salamanders in the world. So salamanders and frogs I was into. And I had uh, done a film on hellbenders, which are three foot long salamanders that live in the mountain rivers. So when I was in Costa Rica filming, I was around 20 and I had read about in Costa Rica, there was the golden toad that lives only in an acre area in the cloud forest. And they come out in like March or April for the, they come out from under the ground for this breeding event in March or April. And so I was like, I got to go see this. So I went up and I found the area and I was there. It was the right time and everything, but no golden toads showed up and they were never seen again. I had missed them by one year. Mm -hmm. And so so that like really sparked me to like, we have to do something to save endangered species because I missed the golden toad by such a short time. Mm -hmm. And then we went to Madagascar with our professor, Dr. Pat Wright, just after she had discovered the golden bamboo lemur and rediscovered the greater bamboo lemur. So that was hope, like things, you know, we could do something. And she created that amazing 40,000 hectare um, for us working with the government and everything. So that really made me feel there was a lot of hope and that I wanted to be a part of doing something to help save endangered species. I think so much of it starts at a young age. And Martin and I grew up spending our summers just camping out in a field in um, in Vermont with our with our families. And there was nothing to do every day but go around hiking out, hiking around, looking for animals and having creature adventures in nature. So I think that was informative for us. So, you know, we get a lot of questions from kids asking, what can kids do to save the wild animals they love? Is there something they can do for these animals that are disappearing and their habitats that are disappearing? Well, I think what, what children can do is to start thinking, it depends how old they are, of course, but if we sort of going eight and upwards, um, they can think about the things that they that they ask their parents to buy. Did they harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Are they cheap because of child slave labor? And certainly when you get older, those are the questions we all can ask. And if millions and then billions of people make ethical choices, it makes a difference. So too many people lose hope because they feel, well, I'm one person, there's nothing I can do. And it's true, if, if you were the one person in the planet who cared, you couldn't do anything, but it's not true because there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, if not coming up to billions of people who really want to make a difference. And cumulatively, these small choices we make can truly make a better world. Mm -hmm. So I found that children, can be so imaginative. I mean, some of the projects our Roots and Shoots groups choose to do, they're working with monarch butterflies, they're working with other migratory species, they're saving 
money so that they can help people who are living in poverty after an earthquake or something. I mean, it's just amazing. They're, they're tackling all the different problems that we see around us from their own love, from their own hearts. Yeah, that's wonderful. That and really I love what you do with Roots and Shoots and your project. They're about communities. They're local. And um, and I think with the Monarch Butterfly Project, if if a person has like a milkweed patch, you're part of the migration. You know, you protect that milkweed patch. You help Monarch Butterflies survive. So so kids, look out look out around your house. And if you have a milkweed patch, you know, you're already part of a part of the monarch butterfly project. That's right, you are. And that's what well, that's what the kind of the way we're thinking with Crab Brothers Creature Heroes is, you know, we're focusing on how animals need homes and they need a place to live and they need habitat. And it's right now a two-pronged effort. One is creating a larger wildlife refuge like Grizzly Gulch, like we have in the past. But the other is to let kids know that their own environments, their own backyard, their own community is important for wildlife too. And like Martin, you were just saying, if you can plant milkweed in your backyard that helps the monarch migration, great if you can plant a pollinator garden that helps bees and other animals. So we're encouraging kids to do um, projects right in their backyards and communities that help it become a good wildlife habitat. Yep, that's uh, absolutely right. Because not all kids are in monarch butterfly migration routes, but right. they, all, they can all help bees. They can all help birds by putting up nesting boxes. They can all help insects by, we call them insect hotels, where insects can overwinter or live safely. All of these things, they may seem small, but when you add them up, and when more countries do them, and then more kids with their passion, and they are passionate, and they get involved, they change their parents, they change their grandparents, right. they change their teachers sometimes. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, the teachers can change the children. Yeah. And the parents can change the children. So it, it's like nature. It's everything interconnected. Yeah. And that kind of leads into another question we've been getting. What would you say to those kids out there who feel they are too small to make a difference? I think you kind of answered one of those questions already. If kids learn about animals, they can teach and, and encourage their teachers and parents to change their habits to help animals. Right? Yes. And I would give one message to the children. And that, I think, is a very important one. So if you care about, well, let's say monarch butterflies, since that's what we're talking about. You care about monarch butterflies, and your parents don't, or your teacher doesn't, or somebody. Instead of kind of attacking them and saying, well, you ought to care, blah, 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 Just tell them about the magic of this migration. Show them pictures. Yeah. Talk about this incredible species that through generations knows where to go and nobody understands it and then you've got to reach the heart and if young children the younger they learn that the better that's the way to change people it's not right. to point a finger and say you're bad right. it's to make them understand that what they're doing is wrong and then they want to change that's great advice. That that could really empower kids who love animals to take your your advice. Yeah, as I think it's really important. Teaching people. Yeah. yeah, and kids can be teachers. You know, kids know, and I find, and I've noticed when they know something about animals and they can teach yeah. older people, their parents or teachers, they feel empowered, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, but let yeah. them teach through pictures and stories, and storytelling is so important, isn't it? Yeah. You do storytelling. We do storytelling, too. Right, right. Well, it is great teaming up with you, Dr. Jane, and it's so great to, to talk with you about all this, and we're really excited to be working together. Yeah, well, I am, too. I think, you know, what you're doing, what we're doing, it's precisely the same. And the more groups around the world that we can gather in to join us, then the more children we can influence and the more the children can influence their parents, some of whom may be presidents or environment ministers or goodness knows what. Right. Thanks, Jane. Thanks very much. Great speaking with you. Oh, great speaking you. with both of you too. And good luck. Yes. We'll see you on the Creature Trail. 
Absolutely. 